Okay, so this is our last thing today, which is a panel on Indie Life moderated by Keith Stewart from the Guardian. Oh, I don't know if anybody can read that. Hello, actually, what's going on? I was trying to shout. I've got a really loud voice. What have I got Oh, oh, okay, thank you. Is this cider? <laughs> Has anyone else drunk during their talks today? No. Okay. Yes. 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 Fulfilling all the stereotypes <laughs> of journalism. <laughs> Our green, <laughs> single green screen. <laughs> At least I think it's a screen. It is. Keith like yes. had a kind of demand of a rider that he's going to do a talk here today. He wanted a pot of cider. A green M&M, <laughs> and a couple of things I can't actually If I'd known you were going to supply it, I would have asked for something a bit more glamorous. <laughs> 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 if I'd have known you could have done that, then... <laughs> <laughs> Already we're seeing what life is like as an Indian developer. What point this argument? Oh, wow, I've got more. Excellent. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Keith Stewart. I'm the games editor for the uh, Guardian newspaper. I've spent a lot of my time uh, talking to and interviewing and interrogating indie developers. Uh, so I, I like to think I know a little bit about life uh, as an indie. Um, I also uh, I work three days a week from home, so I only have to go into the office for two days a week, which is really, really handy. So it kind of gives me a, a sort of a, an insight, I think, into, into what it's like working in a kind of non-typical workspace. Um, I think uh, you know we've all probably we've all heard the rumours of, of what life's like as an indie developer: uh, uh, exotic cars. <laughs> uh, massive mansions, uh, beautiful film stars, all these are things that you can look up on the internet uh, while you're sitting at home in your pants. Uh, <laughs> to be um, I think what we should do is actually we'll start off by uh, getting all of our panelists to introduce themselves and just saying uh, maybe one thing about what it's like, the good thing, the best thing about being an Indian. So uh, if we can start with you, Matthew. Okay, is that one? Yeah. Um, okay, so my name is Nancy Griffith. Um, I'm not the really developer, but I'm I live a bit of a life of an indie. I have my own indie PR agency. Um, I work with indies of all different shapes and sizes, um, helping them do some of their, their studio and their, their game PR, but also training and mentoring to do their own PR as well. Um, and I've been working at home for oh, about a year and a half now. Best thing, I'm waiting to see, it was the worst thing, you've thrown me off there. Um, best thing I saw. Start off optimistically. Yes, okay, okay. Nice to um, yeah, I think the best thing is probably the, the flexibility. Um, I've got two small children, and actually the flexibility of being able to pick them up in the playground more often, and send them to after school club, and all that kind of thing is probably one of the biggest benefits for me. Um. Uh, hi, I'm the Mighty Git. Uh, I'm comfortable calling me that, then uh, you can call me Johnny. Um, I'm Lindsay Vapa, and the best thing is probably being my boss. The flip side of that is my boss hates me. <laughs> 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 um, uh, I'm not Al Lewis. Um, some people know me as Mike, most know me as not Al Lewis. Uh, I'm that guy who's that thing you, you want to have heard of it. Um, the best thing about being in India, I've been working at home for about four years now. And uh, uh, it's, it's great, I've got a family, I like to spend time with my family. Um, and I can be as peculiar as I want to be, it's fantastic. Uh, my name's Jenna, I'm Ray Young Goth on Twitter. Um, I guess the, the, uh, I'm an indie game designer. Um, and definitely the best thing about indie for me actually is how friendly it is. Which given that I recently got sticks to Sweden and uh, meeting Swedish game developers there, it's, um, it's good to be able to instantly have an indie friendship connection sort of thing with them. Uh, my name is Peter Wellington. Uh, I'm not an indie. I'm a, uh, the handheld and games hub editor for Pocket Gamer. Um, and uh, I guess the best thing about kind of well, we work from home essentially, we're, we're scattered throughout the UK and uh, America and Japan. Um, and the best thing is basically, yeah, like playing Clash of Clans with my pants. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got an image for the screen? Unfortunately, I've got pants. Yeah, not really to get any pointers before I have pants. Yeah, my name's Paul Maraboy, I make games under the name of Studios. Um, went full time about three weeks ago, so uh, really it's come from you. But uh, the best thing for me is just uh, don't have to leave the house. It's buying lots of cake, I've got money for cake now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and get to spend time with my son. Oh, my. 
you know, it's just a, uh, just a dream to be able to make something that people actually enjoy playing and get the feedback. As a team, it's, it's all great. Okay. Okay, well, I mean, one of the things I was going to ask about, and this is a thing I have problems with, is uh, procrastination and actually getting started in the morning. I have like a whole ritual of things that I can do before I even like, touch uh, a computer. So I guess one of the big things with indie is you don't have that kind of, uh, the sort of the, the basic structure of an office life. How do you ensure that you do get up in the morning and start uh, creating your masterpiece? What's, do you have any tips for people to start working? So if they're, if they're in an indie environment. Yeah, set an alarm. Set an alarm. Thank you for that job, guys. <laughs> <laughs> You write that one down. <laughs> but then actually get up. And don't engage your brain, just go and sit down and start working. Because if you spend 10 minutes procrastinating, it becomes six hours procrastinating. So try and get in there before your brain kicks in. Yeah. Okay. The phone really wants to have a separate office space. So I mean, if, you, if you just lay in bed, give up, uh, coding, then you can sing a song like some other people do, playing in bed, a lot of working as well. If you do that, it becomes like there is no demarcation between your working life and the rest of it. And it really has to be so that you can start it and stop it. So it doesn't just take up everything. Otherwise, mornings and evenings and afternoons become meaningless every day becomes Sunday, which uh, doesn't really matter. It's a pretty nice thought, actually. <laughs> <laughs> why am I that Sunday? Why am I that Sunday? Now, so, so, yeah, I, I have a home office that's a lot, got a lot of girls and my three-year-old's kind of constantly going and go, Daddy, you want to play games again? Yes, I'm trying to make things here. No, I want to play games. Um, so, yeah, it's not to you, my question, really. Uh, I think get the form out way early. But, um, for me, basically, I don't really think of much else other than games, not all. Pretty much the night before when I lay in bed, ignore porn. When I lay in bed, pretty much just think about what I can do, what's going to work, what mechanics are going to work. So when I wake up, the first thing I want to do is just try it, just get out, get some uh, moving on the screen, and see if the mechanics work. Which is normally don't, but. Yeah, We're talking about the games here, which cool. Yes, sorry. I'm trying to mine the two. I've tried to mine the It's hard to mark. <laughs> what about um, like solitude? Well, is, that, is, that, is, that, is, that, is that difficult to deal with? Like sitting at the now with me, because I've got to write so much, I've got to try and be, I've got to try and be entertaining, I'm not saying I ever actually uh, achieve this, but I've got to try and be entertaining all the time. That can be quite difficult when I'm sitting at home on my bed with a laptop on my lap, um, alone in the world in Somerset, uh, you know, that's bad enough. Um, how do you motivate yourself to be great? Yeah, I've never told you things about my life. Uh, yeah, how do, you, how do you ensure creativity? I mean, how do you keep yourself inspired? Um, that, that's something I've had to actually wrap in with. Um, I moved over to Sweden in uh, December, and so I've had to wrap in staying creative like that with actually meeting people and not just sitting in a, a flat in a foreign country just trying desperately to throw things at the internet. Um, I think the main thing for me has been um, making sure I collaborate with people and. Um, oh gosh, I'm just <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's just making sure that uh, I'm working with other people and emailing them. That, that tends to be my first thing of the day, is, is checking emails, making sure I'm actually getting people still on board. Um, we're, we're working towards targets and things. Is, he, is email the best way to work if you're collaborating with other people online a lot? Is that, is that the best way to work? Or is it like instant chat or Google Hangout? Is that, are, those things easy, are those things useful for a team? I found it useful for um, asynchronous stuff because most of the people I'm working with at the moment are actually students, so they tend to be working on PCs and stuff. Um, whereas I have 
basically all the time to spare. So I can actually construct a reasonable email and then send it off so they can digest it back to their bed. Um, and also having the multimedia things in there. And we could go for collaborative working spaces online, but ultimately just being able to have an inline image and email and up communicating things far more effectively and easily. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, I find I am really useful actually, but partly for the collaboration standpoint, but also just for sanity. Um, you know, I'm, I'm usually kind of on, on and off I am with most of my clients during the course of the day and often with, with former clients as well. And, and I think you can actually replicate some of that office banter that you miss. You know, you may not miss the office politics and the, the, the weird things that come from working in a big company, but you do miss that that day-to-day -day interaction and, and just the silly conversations. And, and I think actually that you know, stuff I am going to save me from the lots of occasions. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you find yourself uh, with your with your uh, customers, your clients? Do you do you advise them on, on uh, the way that they work as well as like producing content for the media? Do you, do you sort of, do you, do you kind of provide a full service for people in that? Way? Yeah, I've got, yeah, I've quite often. I mean, I have a, have a mix of um, a mix of clients. Some of whom are, is, is a probably what you'd think of as a more traditional um, developer PR agency relationship. Um, I'm going to just be executing the PR plans and stuff for them, but you know, a lot of them are working day to day um, on how to actually get better at doing their own PR and doing it themselves. And the guys I took a month ago, a good example actually, they're super keen to learn loads of stuff and they're just like, they're all just like sponges, all of them. Um, and it's brilliant to be able to bounce ideas around with them and find out ways of making that doable for them. Because as you know, Richard admitted, you know, he's not not great with Twitter. They know they need to get better at Twitter. So we we've, we've discussed all sorts of different ways of like, okay, how how can you guys with your skills and your strengths and weaknesses build that into your workflow? Um, and I think sometimes having the perspective I have of having to juggle those things myself and sort of be my team as well, I think can sometimes be helpful for advising that because I've experimented with strategies myself and sometimes it works and sometimes it don't. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. In terms of like uh, developers, um, I mean, we hear a lot, quite a lot, um, of, about the indie community. A lot of people have talked about it today. Is that actually is that actually true? Is it like a big happy family? And does everyone get on? And is it that collaborative? Because see, it's looking from the outside in, it seems to be a, a, a kind of really lovely environment. The games industry. It's like a family. <laughs> <laughs> In that, especially if you watch critical sessions, you will see the things that take out of context, but I'm not watching um, for a while since so everyone's friends again. Um, and the, the reality of it is there are some people out there who are not very nice, uh, as we said earlier on today. However, there are people out there who are absolutely fantastic. Um, and I'll mention to you, Natalie, Natalie and Byron uh, have helped me so much since I decided I want to be an indie game developer um, about a year and a half ago. It was these two people that I, I spoke to first of all and uh, really fell on my feet finding those, those two guys. It been absolutely fantastic. And I've met more people today who reinforced that image that, you know, we, we recognise this isn't a zero-sum game. We're all helping each other produce something fantastic. And if one of us produces something fantastic, that's going to take the fantasticness of from somebody else's product, and we're happy to share and happy to help each other like that. Uh, but yeah, like a family, there's a few things that are sort of informing arts and then making us do. But they are nice people. Mm. What insight that was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd say that um, I wouldn't be making games if it wasn't for the world. I'd still be making games, I wouldn't have actually sold any games if it wasn't for the uh, community. I mean, I've been making games. About 25 years, it's like eight, I think, and it's like the last three years or so, I've actually really set me, it's not even because of the community, like, you know, um, asking, you know, checking out my staff and saying, you know, should do something with this. And um, yeah, it's, it's just kind of bearable. I mean, the first game released about three years ago, just on Xbox Live Indies, and it wasn't very good. To be honest, it's just slow, it's just like all the feedback, it just kind of made me realise that I could do this. Mm -hmm. and, um, just, most people are supporting, there's not that many people uh, who aren't, who are really horrible on Twitter, if you're, you know, at a reasonably low level, and you get to like, you know, feel fish level, everyone's going to hate you, it's going to hate you, it's going to success, but, yeah, I mean, it's the best community I've ever got, and yeah, I definitely would be making games if the community wasn't like it was. Yeah. Is it important to be able to deal with, like, negative feedback? Because I get quite a lot of writing for a living. Uh, I'm sure you do as well. Like when you write a story, 
and like there's a hundred comments underneath, and 99% of them are, are sort of death threats and questioning <laughs> and integrity, uh, and accusing me of all sorts of uh, bias and uh, backhanders. Is it, do, you, do you have to have a, a reasonably thick skin as an Indian Just give you a side of it. Oh, no, here I am. Yeah. You've never pressed back on the skin. You're buying actually slipping 50 quid as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, is that something that you have to deal with? Do you have to be quite a reasonably strong personality to, if you're putting your stuff out there? I, you know, for me, I grew, I grew a thick skin because at the beginning, I remember the first review I got was like pretty much shit. <laughs> And just like, you know, um, when you fuck off, what's the point? I think I think was off, uh, no, I said, no, you get nice people, not all of them. But um, yeah, the first one really hurt, and I was just like, oh, I don't think I can do this. You know, it's just from no one, it's a random comment. And then, yeah, after like, I think it's my third, yeah, after like three or four games now, you kind of grow a thick skin. And I mean, even now, I mean, my last game, I've got um, about 15. Good reviews. I've got eight, and there's one review. I've got three, and I still think about that. <laughs> and I was thinking, like, why are they eight? And um, yeah, I think for me, the, the thick skin kind of is growing. And it's something you can get used to. Well, for me, it's. Yeah, I had to, yeah. Uh, on green light, I had some nice comments and some not so good ones, like, it looks like the most boring game ever. <laughs> Which I can take that, that's fine. But I had one comment that was, I would play your game, but I wouldn't pay for it. That one, that one took me completely by surprise <laughs> and uh, knocked me off track for a couple of weeks. I don't know why. It just it was it went through all the barriers straight to me, and it was like, ooh, that's a criticism of me. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. So uh, yeah, hopefully in the future I can just uh, brush comments like that. But yeah, mm. that one got to be picked. Yeah. <laughs> I'm generally happy <laughs> um, I, I want to keep opening it up to questions. So if anyone has any questions for our panel about working life as an indie, uh, please do put your hands up. Um, I've got lots of questions, but uh, if there's... Yes? So um, how do people tend to support themselves whilst they're waiting for a game to actually be produced and go out and earn money? How do they, what money do they have in the meantime? Uh, well, I can say how I started. Um, I ran a previous business, I think, two games and had a little bit of money on the side. I had this great plan that I had enough money to do three months of development, so I had to completely make a game and release it in three months. <laughs> that was ten months ago. <laughs> so for seven months of that, what have you been doing? <laughs> so uh, it became clear that I needed to work. But obviously, I've tried writing games in, in my spare time. That wasn't going to happen, there's just not enough energy uh, to fuel your power for the of working on somebody else's stuff that you don't care about. Um, so I decided I would try and get some contract, part time contract work, work two or three days a week, and then spend the rest of the time on the game. Maybe that didn't sound right. Working on the game. Um, <laughs> Um, I wasn't sure that was going to work out. I had loads of fears and doubts, and I'd never been a contractor before. Long story short, it's worked out fine. I found people who are quite happy to use my skills just one or two days a week. Um, and contracting turns out to be brilliant because at the end of the day, I cannot care about it. I can just think about my game, and, and that's it. So it's worked out okay so far. Um, there are times when after working two or three days, the next day you go on, right, now, now it's time to work on the game. Where's, where's my energy? Where's my will to do it? And sometimes that, that following day is a tough day, but the day after is usually a really productive day. So there is, there is an impact based on working on other people's stuff. Um, but well, I don't know whether you need to learn to live with it or, or whether there's some tricks and skills if anyone's got to, to work around that. But um, yeah, that's how, that's how I do it. Yeah, how does everyone else deal financially then between? Between games, I suppose one's a bit different because I've been doing it part time. Because I've got you know, for the last three years in my you know, spare time until you know, um, my last game was released in Steam, and now I can support the next project. The money that's coming from there. So yeah, I suppose like, it's interesting to actually see how people make the money you know, to fund it. But um, at the moment, I'm just using my last sale to fund my last game to fund the new ones. But um, it's a uh, 
a lot easier not having a nine to five job. So a bit of time to actually spend that actually making again, actually out to market it. Um, for my part, it's actually mostly down to a very understanding partner, really. Um, so I was working um, at London uh, Mindy Studio beforehand, and with the move to Sweden, it was kind of right. Um, what we'll do is we'll take a, a chunk of cash and basically take a bit of a sabbatical and try and work out how I can make money. And then, yeah, similarly, going for contracting again to work out the best way to um, do a few days work every week on other people's projects and then basically try and generate enough interest in my own to try and sell it through usual routes like that. Okay. I'm just looking that uh, the job that pays the bills on quite enthusiastic part as well. I work for a big Linux company who's releasing a mobile phone operating system very soon. Um, a bit of touch. Yes, I said it. Okay, yeah. I'm getting my bonus. Yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so thankfully that, that's on this. Sorry, flexible. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I love that as, as much as I do uh, making games as well. Um, I, I, do, I do spend a lot of time in the evenings just um, with my laptop making games, uh, working on the, the two key titles that hopefully will release sometime this century. Uh, but my partner is very, very understanding as well. She's like, are you, are you tired? You know, you, 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 there's an 18 hour day, are you tired? I'm like, I was like, I'm telling my secret. I'm always tired. <laughs> <laughs> there is a, I guess there's a problem, like, it happens in journalism too, the whole idea of like, work-life balance. And if you're working by yourself or even in a small team, especially in like, games development uh, and games journalism as well, it's, it's very difficult to make that balance, isn't it? And how do you, how do, you do that as developers to make sure you have time for your loved ones and your other interests away from games, if there, if there are such a thing? I've heard tell. But yeah, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with the work-life balance of being in the um, I think I think it's it's just sometimes you have to kind of like go outside yourself. You have to look at exactly what it is that you're doing every day. You know, like if you are working like 16, 17 hour days, like you can if you want to be really like nerdy about the whole thing, you know, you can you can put together these little graphs and stuff, you go, okay, well I spent ten minutes eating lunch and I do this, this, and this, and I do whatever. And then you look at it and you just go, I'm just working. And you start to see like the quality of your own work kind of start to take a bit of a tumble because you need that ability to just relax and recuperate and let your brain work on all of these things that you're thinking about. Um, uh, sort of in the background, subconsciously, not in, in an active way. So I think it is literally just a case of of not having that mentality that that um, some of the really big publishers from my end and some of the big publishers from other end, like it's not having that mentality of like you know you're not you're not a work workhorse. It's just you know you're a human being. You have to have you can't work huge amounts of huge amounts of hours and still be you know, creative and. and, and Stuff. Yeah, so there's a, um, a really good book that I, I, I um, spoke to some students in Nottingham last week about games development, and there's a really great book, I don't know if anyone's heard of it, called 59 Seconds by Richard Wiseman. Has anyone heard of this book? It's really, really good. I'd like that anyone to read it. Basically, he's a, he's a scientist and he's, he's got together all these uh, lots and lots of surveys and meta-surveys on, on different aspects of life. So it's kind of like a bit of a cerebral self-help book but it sort of gathers lots of self-help information and data and statistics and puts it in a really interesting kind of readable way. One of the things he says is that um, like if you're really, really stuck on a problem, like science has found one of the best ways of dealing with it is just to get out, get out of it and let your unconscious like work out, the, often your unconscious mind can like, work out your problems while you're doing other stuff. So it's not just important to get out to do other stuff, it's important because it actually helps you in other problem saving process because we have a Conscious mind and unconscious mind, and sometimes our conscious mind can actually unravel some of our problems uh, when we're thinking about the things. So that kind of goes on with that. We also have really good advice on procrastination as well, which is one of my biggest problems. And like, apparently, like uh, the best way of dealing with procrastination is just to start something, because as uh, as uh, humans, when they've started a, a task, they find it very, very difficult to leave it. Like it's almost impossible to. Uh, I mean, I haven't said that. I often do it. Uh, but uh, apparently, scientifically speaking, if you can just make one small start on, on, on anything, 
we find it very, very difficult to leave that. That's why waiters, uh, when they're remembering orders, they can order them, they can remember them until their orders are fulfilled, and they immediately forget them. Because while the uh, task is unfulfilled, unfinished, we have an amazing capacity to remember it. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you saying about the conscious and unconscious mind. Uh, I spent a few years as a hypnotherapist. Um, oh, okay. so. Make that what you will, but uh, <laughs> I can certainly tell you that community is nowhere near as friendly as the indie community. Um, is there a community? Oh, this, uh, yeah, the self-help hypnosis, neuro-linguistic programming community is huge and incredibly bitchy, no matter what they tell you. <laughs> but I do have a cross you can take if you want to have that. And there was an end to that story. <laughs> I'm still just bad. I'm just still flummoxed that there's a hypno self help community. Oh, I really good idea. I'm But one of the uh, epiphanies I had was uh, people talk about work life balance, and there are one of my slightly less controversial ones, which um, I think is not going to shout at me, but now it's a default of controversy, is that there is no such thing as a work life balance. It's all life. Every second you spend on something is your life. Now it can be making a game, it can be spending time with your family. It's all moments from your life, and you've got to choose how you spend it. So yesterday, um, I had a day where I really had nothing planned. And I thought, right, I've got to get some time, get out, get, get out to my ID, and, and really get down to doing that first tutorial level for Star Tick, because it's Star Tick and not that on Instagram. Um, and then I thought, <clears throat> actually, today I could spend time with my daughter. And she's three years old, she's going through that wonderfully cute phrase where I can get her to shout any word I want really now, but I'm never going to get that time again. But I know that next week I will get time to work on again. So I just stand with her. So that's why I think there is no work-life balance. Every second you spend, no matter what you're spending on, is your life. So using your child essentially as a kind of a comedy iPhone app. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can write that advice down as well. As long as she was shouting bogeys as well as she could. <laughs> Much to the joy of my life. Okay, anyone else on the work life balance? Yeah, well, I would say, uh, sort of partly on that, partly what you said about um, procrastination, the whole um, um, sort of sub unconscious mind, and, and actually, yes, sometimes stepping away can help, but I think what's really difficult to do when you're working on your own and accountable for your own work, in my case, accountable to clients. Um, I need to be careful what I say here because some of them are in the room. And of course, I never have unproductive procrastination filled days, obviously. I work very hard for all of you all of the time. Um, but I think what's really, really hard is when you know you need to take a step back, when you know that actually walking around the block for half an hour or just sitting in front of news for half an hour or whatever is actually what you need to do. It's sometimes hard to not beat yourself up for doing that because it's you that's responsible for you know, your clients and what they're doing. Um, or your game, or your bills for, for a publisher, or you've got, you know, <coughs> or whatever it is. Um, and I think actually getting into that mindset has been one of the hardest shifts for me. It's mm -hmm. kind of sometimes knowing that I need to step back, and actually that's the most constructive thing all round. But actually think being guilty of doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, from a, from a press and uh, PR perspective, what's the one thing that you wish indie developers did? <laughs> Apart from making amazing games that are really easy to do for a moment. I wish they didn't come to me with an email that says, I'm launching my game, I've finished it, I'm launching it in two weeks, and now I need to do some PR. That's probably what they always did. Does that happen a lot then? Yes. <laughs> when should they come to you? Um, well, it's not necessarily coming to me, but they okay. should start thinking about PR like the very beginning. Mm. You know, you know, at the same point, they're designing the game. And, Thinking about, you know, well, as Steve said in his talk earlier, um, you know, it's looking at market deciding what you're going to do and how you're ultimately going to promote it, who's going to be interested in doing it, how are we going to create things in the game that will make it able to be, you know, to be sold later. And that's not being that the marketing team drives the design, um, but, but yeah, you can't bolt it on afterwards, it's not an actual extra. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. an integral part of the I think, so. yeah, especially in this, in this era, like, I don't know if you agree, but I, feel, I really feel like with a lot of developers, marketing is actually part in some ways, it's part of the game, it's part of the story. 
you've got to like on Twitter and Facebook, and you know, there's lots of like indie developers who are really, really uh, vocal. And so you get an idea of them. So their PR is really kind of part of their lives and part of the game development process. It's not it's not something separate. No, you it's, can't, can't fast track it's, it's things like social media build up either. You know, there isn't a quick way to build a community. <coughs> it takes time, it takes effort. So if you started two weeks before your game launch, you're going to have eight followers on Twitter by the time it comes out. Yeah. So. yeah. And I mean, those are, those are great examples of you know, successful indies use Twitter and email and that sort of thing to, to get in touch with us. But like, that doesn't necessarily mean that. You know, so they're commercially successful, but they're not necessarily the greatest like, critical success. It's like, there's a whole bunch of people I find that just kind of make this amazing game and just don't tell anybody about it. It's like, I was having this conversation with um, this person, uh, somebody who runs a course in Abate, I don't think, and like, they were basically saying to me, you know, like, some of their students were like the equivalent of, you know, games like a fan go. But all they're doing is hanging their paintings in their toilets. Like they're not putting them in galleries, you know. <laughs> and you know, I, I feel like you know, the, the, if there's one thing that like India should be doing, it is you know, communicating better. Because the reason that you've heard of like you know Mike Bithell and you know Rami and you know all these fantastic companies like that and company whatever, it's because they get in touch with people mm -hmm. and they like actually speak to us, like, and they make it easy for us to cover their stuff. Because like. So about you, I'm lazy. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> like, yeah. like, if somebody comes to me with a story, that's far easier than me spending 10 hours trying to create my own. Like, yeah. I know that sounds like really, <laughs> right? But, but I think, um, should we say, I worked rather than lazy? Should we Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think, yeah, you're right. I, I did, um, there's the launch conference in Birmingham that I have done a few times, which is basically a conference for, like, it's like this, it's for indie developers to uh, get together, discuss indie development, but they also, uh, I've done a couple of talks there on, on getting press and working with the press. And they do this event every year, and it's really interesting. It's kind of like a speed dating event. And the, the, I sit there at a the table, and so do some of my colleagues, and, and Keith Andrew from Poppy Game Next Time as well. And we all sit down, and the developers come along and see us, and for two minutes they pitch us their games and uh, tell us a little bit about themselves and give us some information. And it's really good, it's really interesting, it gives you really good insight into lots of developers as they go past. Uh, the last year I did this, I gave every single one of them uh, my business card. This was like 10 developers. One of them got back to me, one of them emailed me. And uh, I wrote about that game. Um, and it's like, what else can I do? Who's the literature of the Guardian gives you? Yeah. Is, it is incredible. Yeah, right, especially right in front of me. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you know, that's, that, that's, that's definitely the thing, isn't it? If you, you've, got to, you've got to put that effort in, you've got to communicate with us. I think that's really, really important. Because um, like uh, a lot of journalism is just noise, you know, it's like a, it's like a mass, like every day I get like 200, 300 emails and then some of those people will never hear back from me and then that's it, whereas one or two Mike Piffle being a really important uh, uh, exception, just keeps, he seems to know exactly the right time <laughs> to email me, I don't know if he's watching me through my Mac camera. <laughs> so, like, the way I see it is, you know, I, I like to, like, mess around on Twitter and like, you know, just get in touch with people and that sort of thing. And like, we were kind of talking about like taking a break from work. It doesn't mean that you have to like, you know, go outside and go for a walk or, or, or you know, go and play some video games or whatever it is. Like, you could just talk about on social media channels, you know? Like, and actually, like, getting in touch with people who you potentially might want to work with or journalists and building up friendships, that kind of thing, and getting your name out there, you know? That is actually something that is productive, but it's and it you know goes towards making a good business. But it's also kind of giving you a chance to relax at the same time. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I agree with that. I've done like a few times actually when it's been kind of afternoons where it's like, my God, I'm banging my head against the desk and it's not achieving anything, and then shutting the sofa with tea and my iPad and so on. And then you know, two hours later, I've been on Twitter. But the number of times those moments have created you know new connections. Or you know things that either the business has come from it, or new general steps, or whatever it is. It's always you know I should actually just use consciously use sulking on Twitter as a, <laughs> as a way to get out of those moments. Sulking on Twitter. Almost, almost. Well, I don't publicly suck. You're like that. Yeah. 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 I think yeah. Um, I think being part of the communication online is like is, is, is really important. Uh, oh, we've got a question. Yes. 
Yeah, sorry, just uh, what you said about uh, the frequency of emails. So when does sort of being persistent <coughs> cross the line to be harassment? <laughs> um, I think when people turn up outside my house, that's crossed the line. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think if, you know, if you send an email to a, to a journalist with a couple of screenshots uh, and a press release and a little bit about yourselves, and you don't hear anything for like a week, a couple of weeks, I think, you know, to, like one more email, just a reminder. And then maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe a, a Twitter message or something. I think that's enough. Um, I think like, the problem with like stopping at one thing is that sometimes you will email an, uh, a journalist and they will be out, or they'll be on a deadline, or they'll be working on a massive story. So like the, the window that you've made for yourself might not align with the window of availability of the journalist. So I think like I appreciate being re-emailed definitely. Like a couple of times, I think is fine, and a little hello on Twitter, I think is absolutely fine. Anything after that, we're getting into sort of dark territory. I think. Yes. Sort of, uh, and I've had a few. I've had a few uh, developers who will um, will come onto my like I've. We'll, we'll go onto my Facebook feed, like Facebook friend with them, absentmindedly, or probably when I was drunk. Uh, and uh, now suddenly they'll turn up on there, they'll turn up on Instant Messenger, or they'll be tweeting in every single conversation I have on Twitter. And that's kind of, yeah, that's a bit much. Like, I've been really, really careful about joining in conversations on Twitter. I think if you have something to say that's really valid, then that's a brilliant idea. Like, talking to journalists on Twitter is an excellent idea. Because every single person in this room knows more about coding and design than I do. And if anyone can advise me on even the simplest, stupidest things about HTML5 or C Sharp or anything like that, like if you know that, and, I, and uh, you, you can become a source to a journalist, and like we live on, we, you know, we rely on people, it doesn't matter how inexperienced they are, if they have like a singular piece of information uh, that we need, and uh, boy, I need a lot of information because I know nothing about coding. Um, you can make yourself available, and that is absolutely invaluable to, to journalists, having people, even if you're just starting out in development, knowing that you are there and you're available to answer questions. Like, I, pretty much every feature I do, I email Byron. Uh, <laughs> I don't really do much in the day that doesn't involve uh, emailing Byron, checking stuff with him. Because <laughs> I, yeah, but, but you know, you're, or, you, you always give me detailed answers, and they're always really interesting, and you understand that if I ask you for something, that I don't just need a one-line reply, it's worth like, giving like, you know, a couple of hundred words on it. And that goes into the feature, and then I always link in, I think, to websites. Or... Yeah, I get a lot of traffic from that, must not I? Oh, good. Oh, there you go. There you go. So, so yeah. Uh, fact, sorry. I, I, I've, 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 yeah, I've, uh, I've kind of hijacked this, and I'm supposed to be hosting and not going on about my job and how to make it easier. Uh, well, that's really important. Um, and is there any more questions? For, oh, yes. Um, yeah, so I I'm find I'm doing a lot of the, the Twitter stuff, um, and then I'm doing the development on the side, but then It'll end up being that uh, I look back and I realise I've spent 12 hours a day, seven days a week just staring at the screen. How do you uh, avoid that or get around that? I think literally my, my only way to cope with that is making sure that some of those tweets are arranging to physically meet the person. That literally ends up, there have been some weeks where I basically just have to say, no, we should get out of the pub or wherever, and that's the only way to really break the cycle. It, that, that's in the period when I'm just sort of trying to make conversations and trying to collaborate with people more. Um, otherwise, it's, it's, it actually comes down to Twitter curls for me. I, I have to decide, right, okay, I'm just not following that many people because it comes down to that. If I follow 100 people, that will take me about 20 minutes to check Twitter. If, if that becomes 150, that, that takes up to like half an hour or so. And it, it's sad that it comes quantifiable like that and you just have to kind of work out the rhythm and then stick to it religiously, you know. I, am, I don't work on the game or on any games on Sunday. That's all basically just rule out the day for working on stuff. Don't look out the window. <laughs> <laughs> I like to do a little spin on my chair. <laughs> uh, and then go get a sandwich, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I can look at the I can actually look at the screen for about 30 hours a day. So just leave the little office, walk around, sit on sofa, stare at the bigger screen, and then look at the feeder. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just vary the sizes of screen. <laughs> 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 always 
it and never stop looking at the screen. That's the main thing, just make sure the screen size has changed. I think we're going to that. Perfect. Well, I think one of the beauties of being in like, a creative profession is that you can trick yourself into thinking that anything that you do is actually <coughs> contributing towards your work. If I don't want to uh, uh, be writing for a while, I think I need a break. And I think, oh, I can watch Game of Thrones because that will tell me a lot about uh, fantasy narratives. And there are lots of fantasy narratives, so I can do that. I would, I would love that skill. It's the first skill I've learned towards making games of programming. Everything that isn't programming feels like I'm wasting time. And I'm, I know it isn't, but I haven't deprogrammed myself from feeling that programming is the only thing that counts. I can help that. <laughs> <laughs> Are we getting a less actually live hypnosis? I think people always think I'm going to make a good point to I hope they'll keep that twice. <laughs> Okay, uh, any more questions? Yes? I was wondering if any of you have tried using the Pomodoro technique to help with triggers. No one's heard of it. Pomodoro technique is basically the idea of splitting um, your focus into kind of little chunks. You have like 20 minutes of work, 5 minute break. 20 minutes of work, 5 minute break, 20 minute break. And it's like one minute technique. Yeah, um, you should be on the panel because you're not really used to the I do actually try something similar, um, but with a lot of the programming I'm doing, it's very, uh, yeah, just physics engines and rendering stuff. And, you know, I don't know. That is excuse me, it's useless because I'm using stuff like that. I'll have to say. <laughs> you know, I've got to put the triangles just right on the screen. And sometimes when I'm in the zone, uh, if I'm interrupted, um, I'm very cross. Uh, and there's people with me who will test it. So, so sometimes it works and it's, it's good. And I do have regular, regular breaks here. Um, I tend to do uh, once an hour, there'll be a 10 minute break. No, and I've got really breaks. So. Yeah, some interesting things about that. It does help you. Otherwise, like people said, you're just sitting and staring at varying sizes of screen, and you, you get to go think, surely I can do more than this to my life. <laughs> <laughs> and on that, Bob Shell. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Converse uh, to just saying, sorry, how do you deal with um, getting distracted with side codes? How do you focus on your one of the special codes? You try not to. <laughs> it's, not, yeah, it's, not, it's not easy. There are so many, during the last 10 months, there are so many side projects or other things or better ideas that I'd love to work on. Thankfully, I've gone through enough time that I know those are distractions. And the best thing to do is just write them on a poster pad, pin them to the wall, and when I'm ready for them, I can just take them off the wall. But all the time, they're just in my head, they'll be nagging at me. Write it down, pin it to the wall, it's there when you need it. Get it out of your head. Yeah, I found that useful myself as well. I've got quite a geographical sort of way of thinking anyway, so whenever I'm working on a project, I tend to associate it with a folder. And then even just things like the physical act of putting things in a folder and closing it and putting it away somehow tricks my brain into thinking that I can move on. I do a similar thing with uh, user profiles, actually. If I'm working on a, a big thing, um, like I was with indie studio work, I created a whole different user profile on my computer just so I could log into that and then log back out and I could go to that physical mindset. Um, and yeah, post-it notes as well, just having them in bits. You know, physically, in, in, physically enacting the listing process is really important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But putting it down. Like, uh, I always have like a massive to-do list of stuff. But if I, if I think of something and do something which isn't on the list, I add it to this and then take it off again. Um, I don't know if anything else like that. I don't that's a sort of bizarre uh, psychopathic behavior. It's a really good thing, isn't it? It's yeah. like the first thing on the list is bake this, so that you let it, that's me always going to put it on the list. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it also really helps to filter out good ideas from bad ideas. It's like there's 3 a.m. ideas, you wake up and you know, oh, what's the idea of the bus runs on? You wake up and the bus and you're sleeping in the bed. Wake up in the morning and it says, open the fish farm. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it helps. Uh, oh, yes. Um, yeah, so being a new developer or indie lifestyle, most of you basically your own boss running your own business. A big part of that is you know, ups and downs, and you tend to have a lot of doubts. So how do you manage those doubts? How do you get past that? 
get other people involved. You become your own worst critic. Uh, I, the, I can't can tell you the amount of times I've seen uh, screenshots, that's a very screenshot on Twitter, and thought, that's just fantastic. That's the best thing I've ever seen. And I said to myself, no, I've got to imagine that I did that. <laughs> it's terrible! Look, you can see all the pixels and how it was put together. It's awful! Now imagine somebody else did it. Wow, that's the best thing I've ever seen. <laughs> so you get other people involved who you trust um, to give you feedback and trust their feedback. Otherwise, I mean, I, I'm terrible for doing it. I will just think everything that I did is absolutely awful. But then I get other people involved who, whose opinion I trust and they say, you know what, it's got a couple of problems here and there, but actually it's solid. The foundation that is solid, you just need to tweak here and tweak there. That really helps. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was uh, playing around with one of the features I just added, and I found myself getting distracted playing the rest of the game. And my first thought was, this is awesome. My second thought was, this is Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> and I was starting to sympathise with it. That's, that's, the kind of, <laughs> that's the kind of battle you have to have with yourself. <laughs> um, with, with Things like that. I always like to go back to the philosopher Barappa the Rapper. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, you've got to believe. Um, and and like, ultimately, I think that, you know, if you want to do this, like, you really have got to believe in what you're actually doing. Like, if you don't, then why should anybody else care? It's like, you know, when you're writing some for example, from my side, when you're working like writing some five, six hundred word review and it's something that you don't think is 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 you know worth like if you think, well who's gonna read this? You know, you, you've got to have that belief that somebody will find it really, really interesting and what you do is is you know um, fascinating to somebody. And it's the same with you know your side of the fence where like what you do is important to people and you've got to believe in your own um, abilities. It's why like from like an outsider, it's why the, the UK indie scene is seems seems a little sort of like hesitant to shout about itself and be like really proud about what it does. Whereas the Americans and the Canadians, mm -hmm. at least from what I've seen, they're so bold and brash and just like, oh that thing's amazing. Like if I go to a conference, like I was at I was in Boston and I was at MWC and it was always Americans and Canadians that were coming up to me. Um, and uh, actually emerging markets as well, because the people that have actually managed to get to those big conferences have enough belief in their own product that they're actually going to come and talk to you because they're making the right connections. So I would, I would say, like, what you do is awesome. Just, just believe that and uh, that should go somewhere. Yeah. I think, it, yeah, you know, I think believing, like, to go on back onto uh, the press uh, for a second, um, like, believing in what you're doing and being able to communicate that, again, is a like, really important part, I think, Process. Like, uh, I've lost count of the amount of developers who have contacted me, I don't do the same thing as a few, and uh, they send me a press release of a game, and it kind of looks okay, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure where I should cover it because I don't know enough about them, and I've gone to the website, there's no information, uh, so they may, they, I, I may sort of follow it up, or meet them again, and we get into conversation, and they'll say something like, oh yeah, you know, I was, uh, I was on the Tomb Raider team for, for, for 10 years. Uh, or, you know, I worked with Hideo Kojima. Uh, but in passing, in conversation, like three weeks after they first sent their press, <laughs> like your life is like a massively important part of the story of your game. So I always tell game developers that, like, if you, want, if you want to get your message out there, then like your game is only part of that message. The other part is you and what you do and what you bring to it and your personality and your hopes and your ambitions and your dreams that you've poured into this game. That's a really, really super important part of, of getting your message out there. In, in that case, uh, I've worked on MMOs for NCSoft, and I've worked on it in my second life, and I've always wanted to make games since I was 12. Okay, that's good, well, we'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Uh, so a two-fold question um, for the game designers and developers. Um, do you find that if you throw yourself into the work so much that your gaming is neglected, and if so, do you find that there may be not so much the quality of the work, but to improve your work, playing games, you get to see what other people are doing. And if you're not playing games, you're not seeing what other people are doing, do you find that reflects in your work? Maybe not making it worse, but maybe not improving it either. I don't know what effect it's going to have, but since I've been uh, spending most of my time uh, making a game, I've barely played any games for the last 10 months. I made an exception for GTA 5. 
<laughs> that was pretty much it. Um, yeah, it feels weird and it feels wrong not to, not to feel like I've got the time to play the end. So I, uh, I don't have an answer to that, but I hope it's not a negative impact on it. I definitely had this problem, and actually, one of the ways to go around it was um, getting involved more with um, well, podcasts, I guess, um, more recently, but also just generally trying to do more geeky things. Because then I'm creating conversations in which, um, like at conferences, for example, it, it took me ages to play even the likes of Tonsils Alone or Gone Home. And these are the sort of things people always talk about. And I feel like, as a game designer in particular, it's just, I, I really should be playing these in order to have a reference point. But for some reason, actually just being able to talk to people about this in sort of like a fandom kind of sphere has really helped actually convince myself that I can spend a couple of hours a day playing these sorts of games. So apart from anything else, that also addresses the work-life balance. It, it, it's not even like being sociable with people, it's just making sure I can actually take some time out and step away from the problem and play someone else's work for a bit or then go back to design documents or whatever. Yeah, I, I had that problem um, quite badly because I had a full-time job as well, uh, that's in my poor baby, so it's just no time to do anything. Um, and for me, I just bought a Vita, it's quite easy. <laughs> and then just like, on the bus, on the way to work, you know, it's just like little pockets of like 15 minutes here. Otherwise, I'd have completely lost touch. And then I think my games would have become a bit too self-indulgent and then been all over the place. And then, Playing games helps you bring it back because then you can easily just keep out of mechanics and mechanics and you only understand it. And then you have to do this massive tutorial and it's some garbled crap. But I think, yeah, like playing games, it's really important to bring it back into the shop. It should be, you know, it needs to be simplified as much as you can. Even if it's complicated, it still needs to be as simple as it can possibly be. And I only really get that from playing other people's games and seeing how they approach that. Mm. I, know, I know as a developer who complete the latest 3DS Zelda game on the toilet in subsequent visits, because that's the only time you can justify not making your own game. Uh, you know, I think you've got to make time on the toilet for playing games, and that's the only time that you can do it. You need more fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Program is fiber. Um, any, any more questions? Yes. Yeah, so um, I want to bring in more to, to the family related matter here. Just to ask, uh, how many have children? Okay, cool. But I want to ask more about, because you mentioned that you grew up with your family or culture and stuff, but how about fitting the entire lifestyle in the beginning of the around parenting? I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not just about you know, spending some time, that's it. It's all about, you know, sleepless nights and all about feeding them, knowing they're healthy, taking them out, and, and you know, all the, all taking care of children. Yeah. Um, that's precisely why I wanted to be in control of my um, Because when, when my wife was pregnant, I thought, right, we've, we've, got a, we've got a period of time coming up which we will never ever get again. So we've got these first formative years of my daughter's life, and they're there, I've got a really mold which usually comes in the relationship with the father, so it be a big part of that. Now, if I can say, right, I can work from here to here and then take time out to help uh, and be a big figure in their life, then that was a huge uh, attraction to why I wanted to do these problems. Um, and it has really made a difference to them, and that's one of the most fulfilling things I found about how I work is really the, the decision was either carry on doing hypnosis and hypnosis courses, which meant I would be away from home in four or five months of the year doing marketing and traveling, presenting and training, or into a, a, an industry which is difficult to, to make it in, but I would be there for her, and that's why I made that decision. I, I'm just lucky because my wife's been really supportive. But, um, I basically just do what she tells me. That's <laughs> <laughs> like, if she's not moaning at me and my son's not crying, then I'm making games. As soon as she's shouting at me, what time do you get inside? That's quite scary. <laughs> but, um, yeah, if it, she does 
in all seriousness, kind of help construct my family life. And she just helps me snap back in. She's not a horrible, rude girl. She's just like, you, know, you need to stop doing that. <laughs> Spend some time with your But you know, I think just having that partner is really supportive. Really I think, yeah, a lot of game developers I've spoken to uh, have really kind of um, introduced their children into, into what they do as well. I was speaking to um, Jonathan Smith from uh, Traveller's Tales, uh, who made the Lego games, and he, he's got, uh, I think, a 12-year-old son, and they are coding a game together, so they're making a game, so that uh, his son kind of understands what daddy does all day, and, uh, you know, he's going to get something and make, like, brilliant out of it. Apparently, he's really good, and he's really into it, and he's learned about pixel art and stuff. I think that's really kind of quite a touching way of not, not only showing your child what it is you do, but also kind of sharing like creativity with them. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, he's only 10 months old, so he's not so great. He's going to start with an easy scripting language. I'm just going to review the controller because he can smash that up since she's out of it. He's actually quite into it. But um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that stage because the reason I like games is because they grow up with them. And I think you're always trying to get back that moment when you first started playing them and it was just so exciting when you would leave the house or everything was new and even though I remember like, some NES games even though you didn't have a clue what was going on and you weren't, had no goal really, you just walking around jumping up and down, it was so exciting and that, I won't be able to get that back myself but I'll be able to see it in him, I think that's kind of really important. So I'm really important when I can study it and that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tend to persuade my parental guilt for coming away for two days this kind of thing because I harvest street passes on my son's 3DS. I took him with me to industry events and he's got more street passes on his 3DS than all of his life. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's just a um, But yeah, I'm a, I don't think about supporting partner actually. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of quite lucky that my, my husband's got his own business as well and works from home and he's always he's been kind of super supportive. But he's been doing that for so long that he's in a really good routine with it. Um, it, it's funny, I, kind of, I, I like to think that when the kids get a little bit older and they're getting into kind of career choices, maybe they will look back and see that both of us had our own businesses and, and they will see that we both still have our own businesses. Um, but I'm hoping that when they're, when they're that age, they will appreciate the kind of you know, the risks we took and the you know, challenges we had and that actually that kind of entrepreneurial approach to doing your own thing is as viable an option as well as something else. Um, I, think, I think the age they are at the moment, they're, and mine, mine are six and eight, and, and I think they think that we don't have proper jobs because we don't have offices. So, so I'm hoping that when they're older, they will, they will appreciate that. But, um, but yeah, I think that, that kind of. <laughs> okay, well, I think that's, you know, I think we should end on family because that's quite a nice, that's quite a nice place to end. So I've got, uh, I've sketched down some uh, important uh, life lessons uh, that we can all take out of this talk today. Uh, so I think you should uh, remember these, uh, take them to heart, and allow them to shape, uh, shape the rest of your life. Uh, so uh, life as a developer, first tip: uh, set an alarm. Uh, <laughs> Get the porn out of the way early. <laughs> Use your children for comedy purposes. Uh, if you can't think of anything to do, publicly speak on Twitter. Uh, avoid looking at the screen all day by simply spinning in your chair. Um, every toilet visit is an excuse to play Zelda. Um, um, what's this one? Uh, stop working when your, fa when, when your family tell you to by moaning or crying. <laughs> and uh, finally, always follow the teachings of the philosopher, pa rapper, the, the rapper, you've got to believe. Uh, I'd like to say thank you very much to the panel. Uh, thank you